Annabelle Lee by Edgar Allan Poe Read for LibriVox.org by David Duckett It was many and many a year ago In a kingdom by the sea That a maiden there lived whom you may know By the name of Annabelle Lee And this maiden she lived with no other thought Than to love and be loved by me she was a child, and I was a child, in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabelle Lee, with a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago, in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud by night, chilling my Annabel Lee, so that her high-born kinsman came and bore her away from me to shut her up in a sepulchre in this kingdom by the sea. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes, that was the reason, as all men know, in this kingdom by the sea that the wind came out of a cloud, chilling and killing my Annabel Lee. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we, and neither the angels in heaven above, nor the demons down under the sea, can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabel Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabel Lee, and the stars never rise but I see the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabel Lee. And so, all the night tide, I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride, in her sepulcher there by the sea in her tomb by the side of the sea. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Azure and Gold by Amy Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Raven Notation April had covered the hills With flickering yellows and reds The sparkle and coolness of snow Was blown from the mountain beds Across a deep sunken stream, the pink of blossoming trees, and from windless apple blooms, the humming of many bees. The air was of rose and gold, arabesque with the song of birds, who swinging unseen under leaves, made music more eager than words. Of a sudden, a slant the road, a brightness to dazzle and stun, a glint of the bluest blue, a flash from a sapphire sun. Blue bird so blue, t'was a dream, an impossible, unconceived hue. The high sky of summer dropped down, some rapturous ocean to woo. Such a colour, such infinite light, the heart of a fabulous gem. Many faceted, brilliant and rare, centre stone of the earth's diadem. Centre stone of the crown of the world, sincerity graved on your youth. And your eyes hold the blue bird flash, the sapphire shaft which is truth. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Burnt Ship by John Donne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Sean Smith A Burnt Ship Out of a fired ship, which by no way but drowning could be rescued from the flame, some men leaped forth, and ever as they came near the foe's ships, did by their shot decay. So all were lost which in the ship were found, they in the sea being burnt, they in the burnt ship drowned. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. By the Candelabra's Glare by L. Frank Baum 
read for LibriVox.org by Miriam Esther Goldman. Oft at night, while on my bed, tossing here and turning there, vagrant thoughts crowd in my head, lingering till in despair I arise and to my desk draw my well worn easy chair and transfer the thoughts to words by the candelabra's glare. Vain imaginings, no doubt, meaning little, rhyming fair, and when they are written down and upon me coldly stare in their newborn black and white, I am tempted to declare, never more I'll scribble verse by the candelabra's glare. Honestly, I never owned a candelabrum, and I believe they seldom glare unless highly polished, but my friend, Mr. Costello, considered the title of this book a good one, and straightway designed me a cover and made me the plates. So I wrote the verses to give the cover countenance, and substituting prosaic gaslight for the candelabra, the matter is true enough. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Children by Rudyard Kipling. Read for LibriVox.org by Ruth Golding. These were our children who died for our lands. They were dear in our sight. We have only the memory left of their home-treasured sayings and laughter. The price of our loss shall be paid to our hands, not another's hereafter. Neither the alien nor priest shall decide on it. That is our right. But who shall return us the children? At the hour the barbarian chose to disclose his pretenses and raged against man, they engaged on the breasts that they bared for us the first felon's stroke of the sword he had long time prepared for us. Their bodies were all our defence while we wrought our defences. They bought us anew with their blood forbearing to blame us, those hours which we had not made good when the judgment o'ercame us. They believed us and perished for it. Our statecraft, our learning, delivered them bound to the pit and alive to the burning, whither they mirthfully hastened as jostling for honour. Not since her birth has our earth seen such worth loosed upon her. Nor was their agony brief, or once only imposed on them. The wounded, the war-spent, the sick, received no exemption. Being cured, they returned, and endured, and achieved our redemption hopeless themselves of relief, till death, marvelling, closed on them. That flesh we had nursed from the first in all cleanness was given to corruption, unveiled and assailed by the malice of heaven. By the heart-shaking jests of decay, where it lolled on the wires, to be blanched or gay-painted by fumes, to be cindered by fires, to be senselessly tossed and re-tossed in stale mutilation from crater to crater. For this we shall take expiation. But who shall return us our children? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Composed upon Westminster Bridge by William Wordsworth. Read for LibriVox.org by Zhu. Earth has not anything to show more fair. Dull would he be of soul who could pass by a sight so touching in its majesty. This city now doth like a garment wear the beauty of the morning, silent, bare. Ships, towers, domes, theatres, 
and temples lie open unto the fields and to the sky, all bright and glittering in the smokeless air. Never did sun more beautifully steep in his first splendour, valley, rock, or hill. Ne'er saw I, never felt a calm so deep. The river glideth at his own sweet will. Dear God, the very houses seem asleep, and all that mighty heart is lying still. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Corporal Stare by Robert Graves. Read for LibriVox.org by Raven Notation. Back from the line one night in June, I gave a dinner at Bethune. Seven courses, the most gorgeous meal, money could buy or Batman steal. Five hungry lads welcomed the fish with shouts that nearly cracked the dish. Asparagus came with tender tops, strawberries in cream and mutton chops. Said Jenkins, as my hand he shook, they'll put this in the history book. We bawled church anthems in Coro of Bethlehem and Herman Snow, with drinking songs, a jolly sound to help the good red pomard round. Stories and laughter interspersed, we drowned a long labas thirst. Trenches in June make throats damned dry, then through the window suddenly, badge, stripes and medals all complete, we saw him swagger up the street, just like a live man, Corporal Stare. Stare, killed last May at Vestibule, caught on patrol near the Bosch wire, torn horribly by machine-gun fire. He paused, saluted smartly, grinned, then passed away like a puff of wind, leaving us blank astonishment. The song broke. Up we started, leant out of the window, nothing there, not the least shadow of corporal stare, only a quiver of smoke that showed a fag end dropped on the silent road. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Crucifixion of Eros by Clark Ashton Smith Read for LibriVox.org by Peter Piazza Because of thee immortal love hath died, Because thy willful heart will not believe, Thy hands and mine a thorny crown must weave, A thorny crown for love, the crucified. Behold how beautiful the limbs that bleed, The limbs that bleed, O stubborn heart, for us! Still are the lids so softly tremulous, And mute the mouth of our eternal need. Though this thy fearful lips would now deny, Love is divine, and cannot wholly die. Draw forth the nails thy tender hands have driven, And we will know the mercy infinite. We'll find redemption in our own delight, And in each other's heart the only heaven. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Darkness by Lord Byron Read for LibriVox.org By Sergio Baldelli In Rome, June 2009 I heard a dream, which was not all a dream. The bright sun was extinguished, And the stars did wander darkling In the eternal space, rayless and pathless, and the icy earth swung blind and blackening in the moonless air. Morn came and went, and came, and brought no day, and men forgot their passions in the dread of this their desolation. And all hearts were chilled into a selfish prayer for light, and they did live by watch-fires, and the thrones, the palaces of a crown of the kings, the huts, the habitations of all things which dwell were burnt for beacons. Cities were consumed, and men were gathered round their blazing homes to look once more into each other's face. Happy were those who dwelt within the eye of the volcanoes and their mountain torch. A fearful hope was all the world contained. Forests were set on fire, but hour by hour they fell and faded, 
and the crackling chunks extinguished with a crash and all was black the brows of men by the despairing light wore an unearthly aspect as by fits the flashes fell upon them some lay down and hid their eyes and wept and some did rest their chins upon their clenched hands and smiled and others hurried to and fro and fed their funeral piles with the fuel and looked up with a mad disquietude on the dull sky the pall of a past world and then again with curses cast them down upon the dust and gnashed their teeth and howled the wild birds shrieked and terrified did flutter on the ground and flap their useless wings the wildest brutes came tame and tremulous and vipers crawled and twined themselves among the multitude hissing but stingless they were slain for food and war which for a moment was no more did glut himself again a meal was bought with blood and each sate sullenly apart gorging himself in gloom no love was left all earth was but one thought and that was death immediate and inglorious and the pang of a famine fed upon all and rails men died and their bones were tombless as their flesh the meagre by the meagre were devoured even dogs assailed their masters all save one and he was faithful to a course and kept the birds and beasts and famished men at bay till the hunger clung them or the dropping dead lured their lank jaws himself sought out no food but with a piteous and a perpetual moan and a quick desolate cry licking the hand which answered not with a caress he died the crowd was famished by degrees but two of an enormous city did survive and they were enemies they met beside the dying embers of an orchard place where had been heaped a mass of holy things for an unholy usage they raked up and shivering scraped with their cold skeleton hands the feeble ashes and their feeble breath blew for a little life and made a flame which was a mockery then they lift up their eyes as it grew lighter and beheld each other's aspects saw and shrieked and died even over their mutual hideousness they died and knowing who he was upon whose brow famine had written fiend the world was void the populous and the powerful was a lump seasonless hapless treeless manless lifeless a lump of death a chaos of a hard clay the rivers lakes and ocean all stood still and nothing stirred within their silent depths ships sailorless lay rotting on the sea and their masts fell down piecemeal as they dropped they slept on the abyss without a surge the waves were dead the tides were in their grave the moon their mistress had expired before the winds were withered in the stagnant air and the clouds perished darkness had no need of vague from them she was the universe end of a poem this recording is in the public domain the death of the hired man by robert frost read for librivox dot org by nicholas clifford Mary sat musing on the lamp flame at the table, waiting for Warren. When she heard his step, she ran on tiptoe down the darkened passage to meet him in the doorway with the news and put him on his guard. Silas is back. She pushed him outward with her through the door and shut it after her. Be kind, she said. She took the market things from Warren's arms and set them on the porch, then drew him down to sit beside her on the wooden steps. When was I ever anything but kind to him? But I'll not have the fellow back, he said. I told him so last haying, didn't I? 
If he left then, I said, that ended it. What good is he? Who else will harbor him at his age for the little he can do? What help he is, there's no depending on. Off he goes always when I need him most. He thinks he ought to earn a little pay, enough at least to buy tobacco with, so he won't have to beg and be beholden. All right, I say, I can't afford to pay any fixed wages, though I wish I could. Someone else can. Then someone else will have to. I shouldn't mind his bettering himself, if that was what it was. You can be certain, when he begins like that, there's someone at him, trying to coax him off with pocket money, in haying time when any help is scarce. In winter he comes back to us. I'm done. Shh, not so loud. He'll hear you, Mary said. I want him to. He'll have to, soon or late. He's worn out. He's asleep beside the stove. When I came up from Rose, I found him here, huddled against the barn door, fast asleep. A miserable sight, and frightening, too. You needn't smile. I didn't recognize him. I wasn't looking for him. And he's changed. Wait till you see. Where did you say he'd been? He didn't say. I dragged him to the house, and gave him tea, and tried to make him smoke. I tried to make him talk about his travels. Nothing would do. He just kept nodding off. What did he say? Did he say anything? But little. Anything? Mary, confess. He said he'd come to ditch the meadow for me. Warren. But did he? I just want to know. Of course he did. What would you have him say? Surely you wouldn't grudge the poor old man some humble way to save his self-respect. He added, if you really care to know, he meant to clear the upper pasture too. That sounds like something you've heard before? Warren, I wish you could have heard the way he jumbled everything. I stopped to look two or three times. He made me feel so queer to see if he was talking in his sleep. He ran on Harold Wilson. You remember the boy you had in haying four years since. He's finished school and teaching in his college. Silas declares you'll have to get him back. He says they two will make a team for work. Between them they will lay this farm as smooth. The way he mixed that in with other things, he thinks young Wilson a likely lad, though daft on education. You know how they fought, all through July under the blazing sun, Silas up on the cart to build the load, Harold along beside to pitch it on. Yes, I took care to keep well out of earshot. Well, those days trouble Silas like a dream. You wouldn't think they would. How some things linger. Harold's young college boy's assurance piqued him. After so many years, he still keeps finding good arguments he sees he might have used. I sympathize. I know just how it feels to think of the right thing to say too late. Harold's associated in his mind with Latin. He asked me what I thought of Harold saying he studied Latin like the violin because he liked it. That an argument? He said he couldn't make the boy believe he could find water with a hazel prong, which showed how much good school had ever done him. He wanted to go over that, but most of all he thinks that if he could have another chance to teach him how to build a load of hay. I know, that's Silas's one accomplishment. He bundles every forkful in its place and tags and numbers it for future reference so he can find it and easily dislodge it in the unloading. Silas does that well. He takes it out in bunches, like big bird's nest. You never see him standing on the hay he's trying to lift, straining to lift himself. He thinks if he could teach him that, he'd be some good perhaps to someone in the world. He hates to see a boy the fool of books. Poor Silas, so concerned for other folk, and nothing to look backward to with pride, and nothing to look forward to with hope. So now, and never any different. Part of a moon was falling down the west, dragging the whole sky with it to the hills. Its light poured softly in her lap. She saw and spread her apron to it. She put out her hand among the harp-like morning glory strings, taught with the dew from garden bed to eaves, as if she played unheard the tenderness that wrought on him beside her in the night. Warren, she said, he has come home to die. You needn't be afraid he'll leave you this time. 
home, he mocked gently. Yes, what else but home? It all depends on what you mean by home. Of course he's nothing to us, any more than was the hound that came a stranger to us out of the woods, worn out upon the trail. Home is the place where, when you have to go there, they have to take you in. I should have called it something you somehow haven't to deserve. Warren leaned out and took a step or two, picked up a little stick and brought it back, and broke it in his hand and tossed it by. Silas has better claim on us, you think, than on his brother? Thirteen little miles as the road winds would bring him to his door. Silas has walked that far, no doubt, today. Why didn't he go there? His brother's rich, a somebody, director in the bank. He never told us that. We know it, though. I think his brother ought to help, of course. I'll see to that if there's need. He ought of right to take him in, and might be willing to. He may be better than appearances. But have some pity on Silas. Do you think if he'd had any pride in claiming kin, or anything he looked for from his brother, he'd keep so still about him all this time? I wonder what's between them. I can tell you, Silas is what he is. We wouldn't mind him, but just the kind that kinsfolk can't abide. He never did a thing so very bad. He don't know why he isn't quite as good as anyone. He won't be made ashamed to please his brother, worthless though he is. I can't think Si ever hurt anyone. Nobody hurt my heart the way he lay and rolled his old head on that sharp-edged chair back. He wouldn't let me put him on the lounge. You must go in and see what you can do. I made the bed up for him there tonight. You'll be surprised at him, how much he's broken. His working days are done. I'm sure of it. I'd not be in a hurry to say that. I haven't been. Go, look, see for yourself. But Warren, please remember how it is. He's come to help you ditch the meadow. He has a plan. You mustn't laugh at him. He may not speak of it and then he may. I'll sit and see if that small sailing cloud will hit or miss the moon. It hit the moon. Then there were three there, making a dim row, the moon, the little silver cloud, and she. Warren returned, too soon it seemed to her, slipped to her side, caught up her hand and waited. Warren, she questioned. Dead, was all he answered. End of poem. This poem is in the public domain. Dubiety by Robert Browning. Read for LibriVox.org by E. H. Blackmore. I will be happy, if but for once. Only help me, autumn weather, me and my cares to screen, ensconce in luxury's sofa lap of leather. Sleep, nay, comfort with just a cloud suffusing day too clear and bright, Eve's essence, the single drop allowed to sully, like milk, noon's water white. Let gauziness shade, not shroud, adjust, dim, and not deaden. Somehow sheathe aught sharp in the rough world's busy thrust, if it reach me through dreaming's vapour wreath. Be life so, all things ever the same, for what has disarmed the world? Outside, quiet and peace. Inside, nor blame, nor want, nor wish whate'er betide. What is it like that has happened before? A dream? No dream, more real by much. A vision? But fanciful days of yore brought many. Mere musing seems not such. Perhaps but a memory, after all. Of what came once when a woman lent to feel for my brow where her kiss might fall. Truth ever, truth only, the excellent. End of Dubiety by Robert Browning. This recording is in the public domain. Dulce et decorum est by Wilfred Owen. Read for LibriVox.org by Bologna Times Bent double, like old beggars under sacks, 
knock-kneed, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs, and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep, many had lost their boots, but limped on blood-shod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of gas-shells dropping softly behind. Gas! Gas! Quick, boys! An ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time, but someone still was yelling out and stumbling, and floundering like a man in fire or lime, dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea I saw him drowning. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams you two could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in, and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face, like a devil's sick of sin, if you could hear, at every jolt, the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest, to children ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie, dulce et decorum est, pro patria mori. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Epilogue to Asolando by Robert Browning. Read for LibriVox.org by E. H. Blackmore. At the midnight, in the silence of the sleep time, when you set your fancies free, will they pass to where, by death fools think imprisoned, lo, he lies who once so loved you, whom you loved so? Pity me? Oh, to love so, be so loved, yet so mistaken! What had I on earth to do with the slothful, with the mawkish, the unmanly? Like the aimless, helpless, hopeless did I drivel, being who? One who never turned his back, but marched breast forward, never doubted clouds would break, never dreamed, though right were worsted, wrong would triumph, held we fall to rise, are baffled to fight better, sleep to wake. No, at noonday in the bustle of man's work time, greet the unseen with a cheer. Bid him forward, breast and back as either should be. Strive and thrive, cry. Speed, fight on, fare ever there as here. End of Epilogue by Robert Browning This recording is in the public domain. Tale 15 of Grim Tales Made Gay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bologna Times. Grim Tales Made Gay by Guy Wetmore Carroll. How a Cat Was Annoyed and a Poet Was Booted. A poet had a cat, there is nothing odd in that. I might make a little pun about the muse. But what is really more remarkable, she wore a pair of pointed patent leather shoes. And I doubt me greatly whether, ere you heard the like of that, pointed shoes of patent leather on a cat. His time he used to pass writing sonnets on the grass. I might say something good on pen and sward, while the cat sat near at hand, trying hard to understand the poems he occasionally roared. I myself possess a feline, but when poetry I roar, he is sure to make a beeline for the door. The poet, sent by scent, all his patrimony spent, I might tell how he went from worse to worse, till the cat was sure she could, by advising, do him good, so addressed him in a manner that was terse. We are bound toward the scuppers, and the time has come to act, or we'll both be on our uppers for a fact. On her boot she fixed her eye, but the boot made no reply, I might say couldn't speak to save its soul. 
and the foolish bard instead of responding only read a verse that wasn't bad upon the whole and it pleased the cat so greatly though she knew not what it meant that i'll quote approximately how it went if i should live to be the last leaf upon the tree i might put in i think i'd just as leaf let them smile as i do now at the old forsaken bough well he plagiarized it bodily in brief but that cat of simple breeding couldn't read the lines between so she took it to a leading magazine she was jarred and very sore when they showed her to the door i might hit off the door that was ajar to the spot she swift returned where the poet sighed and yearned and she told him that he'd gone a little far your performance with this rhyme has made me absolutely sick she remarked i think the time has come to kick i could fill up half the page with descriptions of her rage i might say that she went a bit too fur when he smiled and murmured shoo there is one thing i can do she answered with a wrathful kind of purr you may shoo me and it suits you but i feel my conscious bid me as tit for tat to boot you which she did the moral of the plot though i say it as should not is an editor is difficult to suit but again there are other times when the man who fashions rhymes is a rascal and a bully one to boot end of how a cat was annoyed and a poet was booted The Ideal by Francis S. Saltis Read for LibriVox.org by Floyd Wilde Toil on, poor muser, to attain that goal Where art conceals its grandest, noblest prize Count every tear that dims your aching eyes Count all the years that seem as days And roll the death tide slowly on Count all your sighs Search the wide, wondrous earth from pole to pole. Tear unbelief from out your martyred soul. Succumb not. Chase despondency. Be wise. Work, toil, and struggle with the brush or pen. Revel in rhyme. Strain intellect and ken. Live on and hope despite man's skeptic leers. Praise the ideal with your every breath. Give it life youth and glory, blood and tears, and to possess it, pay its tribute, death. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. I Find No Peace by Sir Thomas Wyatt Read for LibriVox.org by Ju. I find no peace, and all my war is done. I fear and hope, I burn and freeze like ice. I fly above the wind, yet can I not arise. And naught I have, and all the world I seize on, that loseth nor locketh, holdeth me in prison, and holdeth me not, yet can I scape nowise nor letteth me live, nor die at my devise, and yet of death it giveth me occasion. Without iron I see, and without tongue I plain, I desire to perish, and yet I ask health, I love another, and thus I hate myself. I feed me in sorrow, and laugh at all my pain, Likewise displeaseth me both death and life, And my delight is causer of this strife. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Indian's Welcome to the Pilgrim Fathers by Lydia H. Zigorny 
Read for LibriVox.org by Jim Fish on the Texas Frontier on June the 27th of 2009. Sigourney writes, On Friday, March 16th, 1622, while the colonists were busied in their usual labors, they were much surprised to see a savage walk boldly towards them and salute them with, Much welcome, English. Much welcome, Englishmen. Above them spread a stranger sky around the sterile plain. The rock-bound coast rose frowning high beyond the wrathful main. Chill remnants of the wintry snow still choked the encumbered soil. Yet forth these pilgrim fathers go to mark their future toll. Mid yonder vale their corn must rise in summer's ripening pride, And there the church spire woo the skies its sister school beside. Perchance mid England's velvet green some tender thought reposed, Though not upon their stoic mien such soft regret disclosed. When sudden from the forest wide a red-browed chieftain came, With towering form and haughty stride, and eye like kindling flame. No wrath he breathed, no conflict sought, to no dark ambush drew, But simply to the old world brought the welcome of the new. That welcome was a blast and band upon thy race unborn. Was there no seer, thou fated man, thy lavish zeal to warn? Thou in thy fearless faith didst hail a weak invading band, But who shall heed thy children's wail, swept from their native land? Thou gavest the riches of thy streams, the lordship o'er thy waves, The region of thine infant dreams, and of thy father's graves. But who to yon proud missions piled with wealth of earth and sea, Poor outcasts from thy forest wild, Say, who shall welcome thee? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Louisa M. Alcott, In Memoriam, by Louise Chandler Moulton. Read for LibriVox.org by Carolyn Francis. As the wind at play with a spark of fire that glows through the night, as the speed of the soaring lark that wings to the sky his flight, so swiftly thy soul hath sped in its upward wonderful way, like the lark when the dawn is red, in search of the shining day. Thou art not with the frozen dead, whom earth in earth we lay, while the bearers softly tread, and the mourners kneel and pray. From thy semblance, dumb and stark, the soul hath taken its flight, out of the finite dark into the infinite light. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Marshes of Glen by Sidney Lanier, read for LibriVox.org by Greg Bowman. Glooms of the live oaks, beautiful braided and woven, with intricate shades of the vines that myriad cloven, clamber the forks of the multiform boughs. Emerald twilights, virginal shy lights, wrought of the leaves to allure to the whisper of vows, when lovers pace timidly down through the green colonnades of the dim sweet woods, of the dear dark woods, of the heavenly woods and glades, that run to the radiant marginal sand beach within the wide sea marshes of glen beautiful glooms soft dusks in the noonday fire wildwood privacies closets of lone desire chamber from chamber parted with wavering arras of leaves cells for the passionate pleasure of prayer to the soul that grieves Pure with a sense of the passing of saints through the wood, Cool for the dutiful weighing of ill with good. O oh, braided dusks of the oak and woven shades of the vine, While the riotous noonday sun of the June day long did shine, Ye held me fast in your heart, and I held you fast in mine. But now when the noon is no more, and riot is rest, 
And the sun is await at the ponderous gate of the west, And the slant yellow beam down the wood aisle doth seem Like a lane into heaven that leads from a dream. I, now, when my soul all day hath drunken the soul of the oak, And my heart is at ease from men. And the wearisome sound of the stroke of the sigh of time, And the trowel of trade is low, and belief over master's doubt, and I know that I know, and my spirit is grown to a lordly great compass within, that the length and the breadth and the sweep of the marshes of Glen will work me no fear like the fear they have wrought me of yore, when length was fatigue, and when breadth was but bitterness sore, and when terror and shrinking and dreary unnameable pain drew over me out of the merciless miles of the plain. Oh, now, unafraid, I am fain to face the vast sweet visage of space. To the edge of the wood I am drawn, I am drawn, where the gray beach glimmering runs as a belt of the dawn. For a meet and a mark to the forest dark, so, affable live oak leaning low, Thus, with your favor, soft with a reverent hand, Not lightly touching your person, Lord of the land, Bending your beauty aside, with a step I stand On the firm-packed sand, free by a world of marsh That borders a world of sea, Sinuous southward and sinuous northward, the shimmering band of the sand beach fastens the fringe of the marsh to the folds of the land. Inward and outward, to northward and southward, the beach lines linger and curl, as a silver wrought garment that clings to and follows the firm sweet limbs of a girl. Vanishing, swerving, ever more curving again into sight, Softly the sand beach wavers away to a dim gray looping of light. And what if behind me to westward the wall of the woods stands high? The world lies east. How ample the marsh and the sea and the sky. A league and a league of marsh grass, waist high, broad in the blade, green and all of a height, and unflecked with a light or a shade. Stretch leisurely off in a pleasant plain To the terminal blue of the main. Oh, what is abroad in the marsh and the terminal sea? Somehow my soul seems suddenly free From the weighing of fate and the sad discussion of sin By the length and the breadth and the sweep of the marshes of Glen. Ye marshes, how candid and simple and nothing withholding and free! Ye publish yourselves to the sky, and offer yourselves to the sea. Tolerant plains, that suffer the sea and the rains and the sun, Ye spread and span like the Catholic man who hath mightily won God out of knowledge, and good out of infinite pain, And sight out of blindness, and purity out of a stain. As the marsh hen secretly builds on the watery sod, Behold! I will build me a nest on the greatness of God. I will fly in the greatness of God as the marsh hen flies, in the freedom that fills all the space twists the marsh and the skies. By so many roots as the marsh grass sends in the sod, I will heartily lay me a hold on the greatness of God. O oh, like to the greatness of God is the greatness within the range of marshes, the liberal marshes of Glen. And the sea lends large as the marsh. Lo, out of his plenty the sea pours fast. Full soon the time of the flood tide must be. Look how the grace of the sea doth go, About and about through the intricate channels that flow, Here and there, everywhere, Till his waters have flooded the utmost creeks And the low-lying lanes, and the marsh is meshed with a million veins, That like as with rosy and silvery essences flow In the rose and silver evening glow. Farewell, my lord son, the creeks overflow, A thousand rivulets run, Twixt the roots of the sod, The blades of the marsh grass stir, 
passeth the hurrying sound of wings that westward were. Passeth, and all is still, and the currents cease to run, and the sea and the marsh are one. How still the plains of the waters be! The tide is in his ecstasy. The tide is at his highest height, and it is night. And now, from the vast of the Lord will the waters of sleep roll in on the souls of men. But who will reveal to our waking ken the forms that swim and the shapes that creep under the waters of sleep? And I would I could know what swimmeth below when the tide comes in on the length and the breadth of the marvelous marshes of Glynn. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. My Last Duchess by Robert Browning Read for LibriVox.org by Peter Piazza That's my last duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. I call that a piece of wonder now, Fra Pandolf's hands worked busily a day, and there she stands. Will't please you sit and look at her? I said Fra Pandolf by design, for never read strangers like you that pictured countenance, the depth and passion of its earnest glance. But to myself they turned, since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you but I, and seemed they would ask me if they durst, how such a glance came there. So not the first are you to turn and ask thus. Sir, t'was not her husband's presence only call that spot of joy into the duchess' cheek. Perhaps Fra Pandolf chanced to say, Her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much, or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half-flush that dies along her throat. Such stuff was courtesy, she thought, and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy. She had a heart, how shall I say, too soon made glad too easily impressed. She liked where she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. Sir, t'was all one. My favor at her breast, the dropping of the daylight in the west, the bough of cherries, some officious fool broke in the orchard for her, the white mule she rode with round the terrace, all and each would draw from her alike the approving speech, or blush, at least. She thanked men, good, but thanked somehow, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a nine hundred years old name with anybody's gift. Who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling, even had you skill in speech, which I have not, to make your will quite clear to such a one and say, just this or that in you disgusts me. Here you miss or there exceed the mark. And if she let herself be lessened so, nor plainly set her wits to yours, forsooth, and made excuse, e e'en then would be some stooping, and I choose never to stoop. Oh, sir, she smiled, no doubt, whene'er I passed her, but who passed without much the same smile? This grew. I gave commands, then all smiles stopped together. There she stands, as if alive. Will it please you rise? We'll meet the company below, then. I repeat, the Count, your master's known munificence, is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed, though his fair daughter's self, as I avowed at starting, is my object. Nay, we'll go together down, sir, Notice Neptune, though taming a seahorse, thought a rarity, which Klaus of Innsbruck cast in bronze for me. End of poem. Never and Forever by George Charles Sodom Read for LibriVox.org by Semantic Nuance I stood by the Russian river and watched its eddies whirl, where, in its rocky channel, the rolling ripples curl. And my heart was sad and weary, for I mourned a life that was war. And I said, 
in my soul's deep sorrow. Ah, never, never more. Again, I stood by the river, when years had passed away, and watched its whirling eddies, and watched its ripples play, and my heart was glad within me, for I knew on the other shore, once more, I should be with my loved one, for ever and ever more. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. No coward soul is mine, by Emily Bronte, read for LibriVox by Shashank Singh. No coward soul is mine, no trembler in the world storm troubled spear. I see heaven's glory shine, and faith shines equal, arming me from fear. O、oh、God, within my breast, Almighty, ever-present Deity, life that in me has rest, as I, undying life. A power in thee, vain are the thousand creeds that moves men's hearts unutterably vain, worthless as the withered weeds, or idlest froth amid the boundless main. To waken doubt in one holding so fast by thine infinity, so surely anchored on the steadfast rock of immortality, with wide embracing love, thy spirit animates eternal ears. Pervades and broods above, changes, sustains, dissolves, creates and rears. Though earth and man were gone, and sun and universe ceased to be, and thou were left alone, every existence would exist in thee. There is not room for death, nor atom that his might could render void. Thou, thou art being and breath, and what thou art may never be destroyed. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Paul Revere's Ride by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, read for LibriVox.org by Jim Fish on the Texas frontier on June the twenty seventh of two thousand and nine. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere on the eighteenth of April in seventy-five. Hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. He said to his friend, "If the British march by land or sea from the town tonight, hang a lantern aloft in the belfry arch of the North Church tower as a signal light. One if by land and two if by sea." And I, on the opposite shore, will be ready to ride and spread the alarm through every Middlesex village and farm, for the country folk to be up and to arm. Then he said good night, and with a muffled oar, silently rode to the Charleston shore. Just as the moon rose over the bay, where swinging wide on her moorings lay the Somerset British man of war. A phantom ship with each mast and spar across the moon like a prison bar, and a huge black hulk that was magnified by its own reflection in the tide. Meanwhile, his friend through alley and street wanders and watches with eager ears, till in the silence around him he hears the muster of men at the barrack door, the sounds of arms and the tramp of feet, and the measured tread of the grenadiers marching down to their boats on the shore. Then he climbed the tower of the old North Church by the wooden stairs with stealthy tread to the belfry chamber overhead, and startled the pigeons from their perch on the sombre rafters that round him made masses and moving shapes of shade. By the trembling ladder, steep and tall, to the highest window in the wall, where he paused to listen and look down a moment on the roofs of the town and the moonlight flowing over all. Beneath in the churchyard lay the dead in their night encampment on the hill, wrapped in silence so deep and still that he could hear like a sentinel's tread the watchful night wind as it went creeping along from tent to tent and seeming to whisper, "All is well." A moment only he feels the spell of the place and the hour and the secret dread of the lonely belfry and the dead. For suddenly all his thoughts are bent on a shadowy something far away, 
where the river widens to meet the bay, a line of black that bends and floats on the rising tide like a bridge of boats. Meanwhile, impatient to mount and ride, booted and spurred with heavy stride, on the opposite shore walked Paul Revere. Now he patted his horse's side. Now he gazed at the landscape far and near. Then impetuous stamped the earth and turned and tightened his saddle girth. But mostly he watched with eager search the belfry tower of the old North Church as it rose above the graves on the hill, lonely and spectral and somber and still. And lo, as he looks on the belfry height, a glimmer and then a gleam of light, he springs to the saddle, the bridle he turns, but lingers and gazes till full on his sight a second lamp in the belfry burns. A hurry of hooves in a village street, a shape in the moonlight, a bulk in the dark, and beneath from the pebbles and passing a spark, struck out by a steed flying fearless and fleet, that was all, and yet through the gloom and the light, the fate of a nation was riding that night, and the spark struck out by that steed in his flight, kindled the land into flame with its heat. He has left the village and mounted the steep, and beneath him tranquil, broad, and deep is the mystic meeting the ocean tides, and under the alders that skirt its edge, now soft on the sand, now loud on the ledge, is heard the tramp of his steed as he rides. There was twelve by the village clock when he crossed the bridge into Medford town. He heard the crowing of the clock and the barking of the farmer's dog and felt the damp of the river fog that rises after the sun goes down. There was one by the village clock when he galloped into Lexington. He saw the gilded weathercock swim in the moonlight as he passed and the meeting house windows black and bare gaze at him with a spectral glare as if they already stood aghast at the bloody work they would look upon. It was too by the village clock when he came to the bridge in Concord town. He heard the bleeding of the flock and the twitter of birds among the trees, and he felt the breath of the morning breeze blowing over the meadow brown. And one was safe and asleep in his bed, who at the bridge would be first to fall, who that day would be lying dead, pierced by a British musket ball. You know the rest in the books you have read, how the British regulars fired and fled, how the farmers gave them ball for ball from behind each fence and farmyard wall, chasing the redcoats down the lane, then crossing the fields to emerge again under the trees at the turn of the road, and only pausing to fire and load. So through the night rode Paul Revere, and so through the night went his cry of alarm to every Middlesex village and farm, a cry of defiance and not of fear, a voice in the darkness, a knock at the door, and a word that shall echo forevermore. For born on the night wind of the past, through all our history to the last, in the hour of darkness and peril and need, the people will waken and listen to hear the hurrying hoofbeats of that steed and the midnight message of Paul Revere. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Pike by Amy Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Laura Scott In the brown water, thick and silver-sheened in the sunshine, liquid and cool in the shade of the reeds, a pike dozed. Lost among the shadows of stems he lay unnoticed. Suddenly he flicked his tail, and a green and copper brightness ran under the water. Out from under the reeds came the olive-green light, and orange flashed up through the sun-thickened water. So the fish passed across the pool, green and copper, a darkness and a gleam, and the blurred reflections of the willows on the opposite bank received it. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Right to Die 
by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake. I have no fancy for the ancient cant that makes us master of our destinies and not our lives, to hold or give them up as will directs. I cannot, will not think that men, the subtle worms, who plot and plan and scheme and calculate with such shrewd wit, are such great blundering fools as not to know when they have lived enough. Men court not death when there are sweets still left in life to taste, nor will a brave man choose to live when he, full deeply drunk of life, has reached the dregs, and knows that now but bitterness remains. He is the coward who, outfaced in this, fears the false goblins of another life. I honor him who, being much harassed, drinks of sweet courage until drunk of it. Then seizing death reluctant by the hand, leaps with him, fearless, to eternal peace. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Rondo by Lee Hunt. Read for LibriVox.org by Sean Smith. Jenny kissed me when we met, jumping from the chair she sat in. Time, you thief, who love to get sweets into your list, put that in. Say I'm weary. Say I'm sad. Say that health and wealth have missed me. Say I'm growing old. But add, Jenny kissed me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. She Was a Beauty by Henry Kyler Bunner Read for LibriVox.org by Ryan DeRamos She was a beauty in the days When Madison was president And quite coquettish in her ways On conquests of the heart intent Grandpapa on his right knee bent Wooed her in stiff old-fashioned phrase She was a beauty in the days When Madison was president and when your roses were hers, when shall go, my rose, who date from haze, I hope you'll wear her sweet content, of whom tradition lightly says, she was a beauty in the days when Madison was president. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Sluggard by Isaac Watts Read for LibriVox.org by John Nixon, the supercargo of www.thesupercargo.com. Tis the voice of the sluggard. I heard him complain. You have waked me too soon. I must slumber again. As the door on its hinges, so he on his bed turns his sides and his shoulders and his heavy head. A little more sleep and a little more slumber. Thus he wastes half his days and his hours without number, and when he gets up he sits folding his hands or walks about sauntering or trifling he stands. I passed by his garden and saw the wild briar, the thorn and the thistle grow broader and higher. The clothes that hang on him are turning to rags, and his money still wastes till he starves or he begs. I made him a visit, still hoping to find he had took better care for improving his mind. He told me his dreams, talked of eating and drinking, but he scarce reads his Bible and never loves thinking. Said I then to my heart, here's a lesson for me. That man's but a picture of what I might be. But thanks to my friends for their care in my breeding, who taught me betimes to love working and reading. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sudden Light by Dante Gabriel Rossetti Read for LibriVox.org by Miriam Esther Goldman. I have been here before, but when or how I cannot tell. 
I know the grass beyond the door, the sweet, keen smell, the sighing sound, the lights around the shore. You have been mine before. How long ago I may not know, but just when a swallow sore, your neck turned so, some veil did fall, I knew it all of yore. Then, now, perchance again, oh, round my eyes, your tresses shake. Shall we not lie as we have lain, thus for love's sake, and sleep and wake, yet never break the chain? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Tri Ante Wanty Gongalope by C. J. Dennis. Read for LibriVox.org by Ruth Golding. There's a very funny insect that you do not often spy, and it isn't quite a spider, and it isn't quite a fly. It is something like a beetle, and a little like a bee, but nothing like a woolly grub that climbs upon a tree. Its name is quite a hard one, but you'll learn it soon, I hope. So try, 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 anti wanty. Trianti wanty gongalope. It lives on weeds and wattle gum and has a funny face. Its appetite is hearty and its manners a disgrace. When first you come upon it, it will give you quite a scare. But when you look for it again, you find it isn't there. And unless you call it softly, it will stay away and mope. So try, try. Try anti wanty, try anti wanty gongalope. It trembles if you tickle it or tread upon its toes. It is not an early riser, but it has a snubbish nose. If you sneer at it or scold it, it will scuttle off in shame. But it purrs and purrs quite proudly, if you call it by its name and offer it some sandwiches of sealing wax and soap. So try, try, try anti wanty try anti wanty gongalope But of course you haven't seen it, and I truthfully confess that I haven't seen it either, and I don't know its address. For there isn't such an insect, though there really might have been, if the trees and grass were purple and the sky was bottle green. Is just a little joke of mine, which you'll forgive, I hope. Oh, try, 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 anti wanty, try, anti wanty, gongalope. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Unquiet Thoughts by John Dowland. Read for LibriVox.org by John Nixon, the supercargo of www. The supercargo dot com. Unquiet thoughts your civil slaughter stint, and wrap your wrongs within a pensive heart, and you, my tongue that makes my mouth a mint, and stamps my thoughts to coin them words by art, be still, for if you ever do the like, I'll cut the string that makes the hammer strike. But what can slay my thoughts, they may not start, Or put my tongue in durance for to die, When as these eyes, the keys of mouth and heart, Open the lock where all my love doth lie, I'll seal them up within their lids for ever, So thoughts and words and looks shall die together. How shall I then gaze on my mistress' eyes? My thoughts must have some vent, else heart will break. My tongue would rust, as in my mouth it lies, If eyes and thoughts were free, and that not speak. Speak, then, and tell the passions of desire, Which turns mine eyes to floods, my thoughts to fire. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.